بسم الله السلام عليكم السلام عليكم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا إنك سميع مجيب الدعاء اللهم أني أعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع وقلب لا يخشع ونفس لا تشبع ودعاء لا يسمع ربنا لا تزق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Welcome everyone I made it different today It's just because of the number of the questions we are getting Wherever I go, subhanAllah, wherever I travel There's always like can we have a question and answer So I opted to do this And I'm going to take one from I can't tell you how many questions I got And I was like did I make a major mistake But that's okay And then so I actually يعني, I chose different topics يعني, Different categories Right? So I'm going to share with you. So if in, in between, like from moving from one question to the other, if, I, if you have any questions from the audience, because actually it should be, it is your session. Let's put it this way. But a couple of the questions, most of the questions is very relevant. And I loved it because almost all of them came from women, and it's related to us, women. And family, and I'm, I'm going to read with you. I mean, a couple of the questions, I was like, wow, I got a question from a 14-year-old. It's probably going to take all of us. All of the class. We're going to try be Idnillah to make it once a month. So we can continue with topics and then once a month we will do it, questions and answer be Idnillah. So let's start with the first one. First one is very common actually. And it says the following there is no name and I don't know, even if I have the name, I'm not going to uh, read the name. So the question is Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. How does one cleanse their heart from hatred for someone who does wrong to them day in, day out? Then she said, I promise myself every day that I will ignore and forgive this person for the sake of Allah. But I fail every day because something new happens. It really doesn't matter what this person does, but what matters is, this is what I loved about the question. Let's see if you will feel what I felt. She said, it doesn't matter what this person does. What matters is, I have failed Allah again. And all my good deeds are being eaten up by this hatred in my heart. I loved it. That's why I put it number one, had a question. I feel immensely burdened by this. And it saddens me that I am not the better, bigger person to completely clean the state and forgive this person. Please advise. I don't know how old, where is she? I just got the email and the question. This applies to all of us. Nobody in this room, nobody on with me online, nobody in this world have not lived a time, if not repeated time, where someone have bothered you, um, did an act of injustice to you. Truly, not you are perceiving it. It's real, right? Um, stabbed you in the back, disappointed you. So this is what I when I read this, I say, welcome to the world. And this is why this life, dunya is dunya. So we all have to accept it, number one. Especially I'm talking to the young because you are not yet. SubhanAllah, I wish I was your age, but I didn't know anything and everybody was beautiful and nice. But the more we grow up, and it's part of the world and part of the life. So this doesn't mean, okay, khalas, you do this to me, I'm going to hate you. This is what I say to myself before I will give you the, the answer. And I actually, some of these answers I really researched. Number one, what is the difference between me and everybody else? This is very important for you. Where are you with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It doesn't matter. I'm not seeing everybody. I'm talking between me. That's why I loved the second part of the question, which it doesn't matter what this person does. And again, I don't know he, she, who's that person? But it is every time I fail Allah, what is she looking at? She's looking at her relationship with Allah. That's where the starting point should be for everybody. Once you start seeing people, it gets very difficult, almost impossible. I really mean it. It's always whenever something good happens to us from through people, or here we are, the first thing it has to be two things. Why Allah allowed this to happen? 
Nothing happens without the will of Allah, right? When you say Jazakillahu Khair, Allah allowed it. When you say you're the worst person I have met, Allah allowed it. So the first question is, why did Allah allow it? Meaning, what does he want from me? What does he expect from me? One. Two, how should I act in the way pleases Allah? Neither pleases me, nor pleases people. And this is where this, this verse in Surah Al-Hashr, and I highly recommend all of you memorize it like your name. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after he praised the muhajireen, the immigrants, and then Ansar, the helpers. He said, there is people who are going to come afterward. This is you and me. وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ They came afterward. يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اخْفِرْ لَنَا ذُنُوبَنَا Look at the sequence. Number one, Ya Allah, forgive our sins. What does that mean? I probably have done this. Maybe I didn't do it intentionally. I am sure I've hurted somebody. I'm not an angel. None of us are. But usually what happens, we don't see our faults. We don't see our mistakes. And if someone comes and tells you your mistake, that's when you know who you are. How do you take that mistake? So number one, I will say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed it. And then what does he want from me? Those who comes afterward, يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اغْفَرْ لَنَا ذُنُوبَنَا Ya Allah, please forgive me. Forgive my sins. And not only for me. I'm not selfish. وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ And everybody that came before me, believers, now comes the point. Because the question is the feeling in the heart. وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلًّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Ya Allah, don't put in our hearts. Ghil, it is not only anger and hate. It's a combo. It's malice. When you, that, when you see that person, she or he, you really don't want to see them. And everything inside you changes. And you say, I don't want to see her. I don't want to see him. And then if any word comes in, what's the response will be? Immediately you have to say, Rabbana la taj'al fi qulubina ghil al-ladheena amanu. Ya Allah, don't put in our hearts hatred to anyone just because they are what believer this is what I, the, the verse said it doesn't matter not all believers are angel not everybody does perfect right so number one and this happens to me and i'm sure happens to you and this verse literally like you put anesthesia on a wound Immediately you look at this person and say, Rabbana la taj'al fi qulubina ghilla al-ladheena aman. Ya Allah, don't put, you're begging Allah. You're turning to him. This is an act of worship. You will be rewarded. I will be rewarded. La taj'al fi qulubina ghilla al-ladheena aman. Don't put any hatred in my, inside me. Doesn't matter what they did. The other verse which will help you not only clean your heart, but also makes you react in a best way is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it to Sayyidina Abu Bakr. And you all know the story when Sayyidina Aisha was accused and then who spread the rumor? Now imagine you live in here and everybody in town is talking about you. Not negative in the worst case scenario. And you are the daughter of Abu Bakr and the wife of Rasulullah Who spread the rumor? Who said, did you hear? Text, share, was his relative. His relative is poor and Sayyidina Abu Bakr always spent on him. So here, the scenario is that Sayyidina Abu Bakr didn't do anything, anything, on the contrary. And this man, out of weakness, just surprised. I mean, how many times do we say things and you say, why did I say it? And then Sayyidina Abu Bakr naturally, this is his daughter, said, that's it. I'm not spending a penny on this man. Fear or not? Fear or not? And Allah revealed the verse. It's in Surah An-Nur. وَلَا يَأْتَلِ أُلُوا الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ وَالسَّعَاتِ أَنْ يُؤْتُوا أُلُوا الْقُرْبَى وَالْمَسَاكِنَ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Fa'fu wasfahu. This is the, the million underlines. Fa'fu wasfahu. How can I do this, Ya Allah? Allah tuhibbuna iyaqfir Allahu lakum. Wallahu ghafoorun rahim. And so what Allah is saying? He's saying those who have wealth and Allah has expanded their sustenance, do not, do not 
stop spending. Specifically, this is Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Do not spend, do not stop spending on those who are poor and they are immigrants for the sake of Allah. And then what will make me do it? Now, this is very easy said. This is not easy done. I mean, think of all the scenarios. And Allah says, Fa'fu wasfahu. Two orders came to him. Forgive and pardon. Forgive meaning, I'm not going to retaliate. And I am not, I'm going to try to avoid you. Fasfahu, there is nothing in your heart. And in general, I will respond even better. What a heart I need. Honestly. Right? What makes me do it? The next in the verse. Don't you want Allah to forgive you? And I say this to, I remind myself all the time, because we all go through this. How many times you and me, and show me hands, we have disobeyed Allah? How many times? Right? Just today. Don't tell me the number. Did he kept feeding me? Gave me all the things? Brought me in here? Brought you here? Right? Tomorrow will be, inshallah, even better. Don't you want Allah to forgive you? The answer is, that's what Sayyidina Abu Bakr did. Naam Rabbi. He immediately talked to Allah. Bala wa Rabbi. By Allah, yes. And he not only spend or uh, reinstate the payment, you know what he did? He gave him even more. So this is this case has two parts. Parts is me internal. So this is what you are, we have to do. And this is not going to be a day or two. This is constant. And then in your salah, in your dua, you say this dua. Clear my heart. If you don't know the ayah, you say clear my heart. Don't, have, don't let my heart have any grudges, hate on anybody. Now second, this person is day in, day out. Try to avoid that person as much as you can. Again, she didn't explain what is the relationship. But if this is a friend, absolutely pull away. They, don't, they will not change. You need to reach a point where you accept people the way they are. It's very hard, by the way, because you still have expectation. Avoid as much as you can. They text you, respond with one word. Respond, because it's actually salam and raddu salam. But minimum, one word. Don't argue. Don't try to explain. It's going to go nowhere. It's going to add. So again, I don't know. I don't know. Imagine this is the parents. Imagine this is a child. Imagine this is a husband or a wife. In and out. That's what she said. They in. Or siblings. So try to avoid as much as you can. And a lot of dua, and may Allah make it easy. Again, it is not easy whatsoever, but Allah makes things easy. This is a very tough one. It took me a while to answer, actually. And I'm going to read it. This will hit hard for many of you. How do you suggest managing a rebellious teenager? Wait to, to hear. 14-year-old who's currently anti-everything anti her parents likes, most importantly, Islam. She complains a lot when we take her to Islamic lectures, refuse to wear hijab in those settings. Do we stop taking her? That's the first question. She doesn't want to associate with the Muslim kids in her school, so she doesn't even try forming a relationship with them. We are new to the area, so she doesn't have a lot of relationships yet. We have tried arranging get-together with Muslim families, with girls the same age as her, but so far, she has not clicked with them and is suspicious of our motives in inviting them. Now, background, I'm glad she gave that. Before moving here, she had a couple of Muslim friends whose fa families are much more liberal than ours. She didn't give me detail. We lived in an area for work with much smaller Muslim population and moved as soon as the chance to a larger metropolitan area in hopes she makes friends. I, for now, that's the mother. For now, I have backed off on directly mentioning Islamic things to her because she thinks all I do is lecture. And I am just working on strengthening my relationship with her as a person. Now, mother feeling. 
I feel so sad because I have tried my best since she was a baby to expose her to Islam from Sunday school, weekday uh, Islamic classes, learning Arabic, reading Quran and Islamic children books in home, listening to nasheeds, making our holiday fun and festive and educational. Unfortunately, she is very attuned to what outside society thinks and she has picked up on these strains of anti-Islamic sentiment. In this situation, do you have any su suggestion what to do? Deep breath, right? Yeah. Exactly, that's how I did when I read it. I'm not gonna look here and says how many of you are, no, I'm just kidding. This is very, this is very normal. It's very normal. I can't tell you how hard it's becoming for both, for the parents and for the children. Don't you think it's only hard for the parents? It's very hard for the children. They really want to please their parents, but the pressure on them is very hard. And I'm not defending them, but it's real. It's real. Just click on TikTok and see what they see. The pressure, even IG, all these influencers, right? Everything is against Islam. Everything is against Islam. So what do you do? This is a couple of things I said. I'm like, tried really to think hard. Number one, I, I'm just gonna start from the, from the end. The, the result of the children is not in your hand. That doesn't mean it's okay, these feelings are. But the result, how the children will grow up, how they will turn is not in my hand or yours. You really have to live with this. Because the way we are attached to our children, part of it is because they are my children. So when people bring a negative comment about the child, you know who gets hurt first? The mother, why? Why? Because I raised her. So as if they are criticizing me. We need to move away from this. The children, the end is not in your hand. Sayyidina Nuh, his son is kafir. And Sayyidina Ibrahim, his father, was kafir. So number one, and you have always, in, in, literally in everything we do, the end result is not in my hand. Like I prepared all this and you all came in. Allah allowed it. Could have been that Allah will not allow it. This will not happen. So that's number one. Number two, come to the reality. This is a 14-year-old, which the hormones are on the peak. Very sensitive. You, do you remember when you were 14? Right? May Allah help our parents. Yeah, I mean, we are, we are adult, but we are not adult yet, right? We think we know, and I'm not putting them down, but we all were 14 years old. We think we know reality, we don't know, right? But we think we know, especially these days, everything is available, I go and read and I say it. And also, especially living here, girls especially more than boys, the issue of identity, who they are. I'm not talking about the other identity. I'm talking to them. Are they Muslim? Are they non-Muslim? Are they practicing? Are they non-practicing? Where do they fit? The last couple of times when I'm with the youth here, that's the commonest question comes out. Fit in. This is what this girl is trying to do. How easy it is you go to a, a, a 1,000 school 1,000 students school, and everybody looks at you and make fun of you. And you know, what can you be? The reason I'm saying this, I'm not defending the girl, but I need parents, mothers to understand this. This is not back home when I and you, you, you go to class, everybody is you and me. And we still had issues. This is, she's probably the only one. So what do we do? Number one, you come to this, not comparing her with you and what you were those days. It's not those days, not even 10 years ago. 10 years ago was much easier. I'm sure you all know this. If you have children who are like in their 20s now and you have teenagers now, you think this is a different century. Three, and I, easy to me to say, and may Allah make it easy for this mother. She needs to be very patient. And don't respond and let her, leave her. Don't push her. The more you push, the more she will go away. When do you intervene? And you have to be very vigilant also. 
because 14 years old is when people start, doesn't know exactly right from wrong, meaning the real, right? And then you are scared also, this is your daughter, you don't want her to go to the extreme wrong. Pull away, a lot of dua. Don't you ever give up on them at all. And never, when, especially when you get upset, because you know sometimes how they respond. And when they respond, you get so nervous and you get so angry. Don't you ever make dua negative because you don't know what Allah and when Allah is listening. There is a very famous, very famous, he just died recently actually. He was in Jeddah when I, and I remembered I attended the Jumu'ah khutbah about that. He was completely paralyzed. One time he really upset his parents. He lied and they knew he was lying. His mother said, go, may Allah break your back. He went diving and he fractured his neck and he was completely paralyzed, completely from here. Then he became one of the best da'i. Because he always say, it's my mother's dua. And the whole Jum'ah khutbah was about, don't do dua on your, on the contrary. Ruh Allah yahdik. You know, we say this, go, may Allah guide you. Perfect. Perfect. What do you want? Or when someone says, Allah yahdik, you say, ameen. Don't get upset. She just made dua for you. He said, ameen, please, ya Rabbi. So make, and honestly, take it positive. Make a lot of dua to your children. Now, number one, uh, to me, number one, don't get upset to anyone, and especially the, uh, the, the questioner. You need to be the example, the role model. And I'm talking about the role model. Your relationship with Allah has to be there. Your dress code, your Islam, your salah, right? That, what does that, that doesn't necessarily mean she'll follow you, but at least when you make your dua, Allah will respond. And you know Allah will never let you down. Because you turn to him and says, I did everything you want from me. Not with the child, but with me and you. In case, again, I don't know the woman, but in case, and we all, you need to go back. Because this could be the sign that Allah wants you back. When Allah make me go through difficult time, the first question I say, what, do you, what did I do? Don't blame people. What did I do? And show me, your Rabbi, and show me what you want from me. So look at yourself. Make a lot of dua. Keep reminding yourself the end result is not in your hand. Be very patient. Pull back. Pull back. A lot of these, this age, boys and girls, right, they want to do it their way. But also keep an eye. Because there's limit. You don't want them to go. But it is not easy. I had a friend of mine said, I wish I can put them, don't laugh. <laughs> she said, I wish I can put them in the freezer from 12 to 18. I'll get them out at 18. <laughs> I'm like, oh, why 18? <laughs> she said, at least this is the, which is true. This is the toughest time. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. And don't get, I mean, again, it's easy said, don't get upset. The best way is to be their friends. If you are a person who the girl comes to you when she has a problem, you're her friend. If she goes to you, somebody else and say, tell mom, then you are not her friend. Because she's worried what's your, don't say when she comes to you and says, I smoked today, I vaped. Don't say, is this is my daughter? Is this is what I, and what people will say, she will never say anything. Change your face. Don't say it's okay because it's not okay. But say, let's talk about it. I know everybody doing it. You know, any, be, be clear, be frank. This is reality. And let's talk about it. Then she will open up to you. So the, it's extremely important to build a relationship with it. And it doesn't come at 14. It comes much earlier. And may Allah make it easy. Now, this is a teenager question. And I put the title, Amazing Teenager Question, right? Assalamu alaikum. I am 14-year-old. Look at the opposite. Subhanallah. So I am a 14-year-old Muslim girl. And here are my questions for the Tuesday, May 23rd. So specific, I loved it. 
And there's many, but I'm going to choose some so I can cover more. What should I do if I like someone in high school? Can I talk to him? He's a Muslim. I love the question. She's so sweet. If I have, if she's in front of me, I'll hug her. Because she's so sweet. Look at the rest of the question. So what should she do? How many mothers here have 14-year-old girl? Okay, what do you do? Yeah. I don't know, Ya Rabbi. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Number one. Number one, acknowledge the feeling. Don't tell her, ah, you're still young. That's it. You shut her off. Remember, I come to you and says, I'm very sad. Why you're sad? Allah gave you everything. Right? She's not going to listen to me. She brushed my feeling. You should say, really? Why? Subhanallah. Okay, let's talk about it. So the first thing this, when you say, okay, let's talk about it. And don't say haram, we are going to Jahannam, all this nine yards. Leave Jahannam in its place. Number one, I, mean, if I, I need more, more, I will ask more questions before I answer this, but just general. Number one, why do you like him? Well, he's a Muslim. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. <laughs> right? <laughs> but why, why do you like him? What is in this boy she's missing at home? She's 14 years old. Right? Probably. Love or caring. Caring. It's not only love, but it's caring. You feel somebody cares for you. So, okay. And you say, okay, come on in. Okay. So what do you like about him? Talk to her. Right? What do you like about him? Let's see. And then you ask about the boy. Does he, does he, does he, does he? How do you know you like him? Analyze the feeling, because sometimes we know I love you. We don't know what this even means. So how do you like him? And then, what do you want me to do? You ask her. As a mother, what do you want me to do? How can I help you? Don't say you're too young, or you're going to get old, you'll forget. What, are you gonna, what do you want me to do? Yani, the most important thing is acknowledge the feeling and acknowledge the challenge. She is struggling. Why did she send the question? Why did she say, what, what do I do? Because she knows it is the beginning of something maybe not right. Right? Why do you ask this question? So, can you always, when someone asks the question, look at the positive in it. Don't look at the negative. Read in between. Right? So we will say, okay, let's talk. What should I do? Again, I can't answer because I don't have a lot of details, but I was like, how are you communicating? If it is daily texting, or before I go to bed for two hours, now we are sleeping. We have to be careful. And what is the end result of this liking at age 14? And the only thing I will say, I always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I always say, and start and end with a dua, because he's the only one who's going to protect us. And I will say, you know what, my beauty, go and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at this stage not to get you attached to anyone. You know why? Because you'll get hurt. You know, and you're at 14 and you get hurt, ouch. But in general, can she talk to him in the school? Yes, but outside the school, preferably not, because it will, it will slip. I had the same question, subhanAllah, from a 21-year-old last weekend. And she, and she was telling much more. But it usually starts by liking and then, you know, texting, and, and you get attached. Especially us women, you get attached. So you need to also protect what I will do again. And if she is hearing me, I probably will say, I need more, more detail. Look at the next one. Wallahi, I have not asked this question myself, to myself. She said, what do I, why do I feel I am not good enough for Allah? Wow. SubhanAllah. How do you answer if this is your daughter came to you? SubhanAllah. The first thing I will say, Barakallahu feek. What you are looking for is what Allah think of you. Right? The question says, I don't feel I'm good enough for Allah. Meaning, I, I have Allah in my life. 
and I have, and I am paying attention to where is my relationship with Allah. This is 14 year old. This is not you and me. And then I'm going to say, why you're not good enough for Allah? On the contrary, now you need to give a lot of positives because this can go also another another way. Why you're not good enough for Allah? Don't you believe in Him? Start with the basics. Don't you believe in Him? Don't you worship Him? Don't you see He's seeing you? Don't you see He? Don't you turn to Him when you need something? Right? And then we come into what is the things you do for Him? We get, start with the basics. Right? Let's say she prays, but I don't pray regular. Don't say oh, you're not good enough. Okay, then this needs improvement. We'll talk about it later. And then, do you sin? You always, but don't use the word sin. I said, what do you do? That you think you're not good enough to Allah. Let her speak. But always encourage them. And always starts by saying, nobody will be enough, good enough for Allah. Not because we are sinner, but because what he gave us. Like when somebody is so generous to you, you say, whatever I will do is not enough for you as a human being. But this is very good heart to human being. If I was her mother and she asked me this, I'll kiss her, her head to her toe. Because at 14, and Allah is the most important thing to me, and I'm thinking what he think of me. Subhanallah. Look at this. This is a very nice question. The same girl. What are some things that make me happier as a person? This is a thinker, by the way, Hadi. Honestly, she's a thinker. She thinks deep. What makes you happy? I will say, as simple as ice cream, right? Cup of coffee. Anything that's halal, that makes you feel good, do it. Yani Islam doesn't say don't be happy. Allah used the word farah, happiness, many times in the Quran. We are not an ummah of very serious. No, we are also ummah of happiness and celebration. What do we do in Eid? It's going to come again next month. What do we do? Right? We eat, we drink, we all. With, with the Islamic boundaries. So what makes you happy? In general, what makes me happy? Sometimes feeling, sometimes doing things, achieving things, and sometimes doing nothing. Sitting on that couch, sipping your tea or coffee, whatever you like, right? Exactly, and you say, oh, alhamdulillah, there's nothing I worry about. But in general, again, general answer to this question, there's so many things that will make you happy. And we're not going to give lecture about look around you, what Allah gave you, right? But sometimes you look at an animal and you smile, right? I mean, like a, 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 two kittens are playing, right? Don't make you smile. So there's so many things. Some Most of us as a human being, especially if we are, not only connected with Allah, but if we look at the real life, sometimes very simple things makes us happy. And the more simple things makes you happy, you are a simple person. Unfortunately, the more the more Allah gives us, happiness become moves further because we have it all. What are some look at this is again her question. What are some productive ways to spend my free time? Productive. She didn't say fun. Subhanallah. I always say number one is sports at this age. At 14, let the, the youth play sports. I mean, alhamdulillah, we live in California, beautiful weather, you know, hiking and swimming for the girls in a, in a girls' uh, setting, um, bicycling, sports, play basketball, play football, or play soccer. In general, sports is the best way to spend your time because it will get out the energy, makes you feel good, and makes you feel tired, and you don't have time for others. I, I see a lot of the mothers complain. I take them from one practice to the other. I said, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Because if they have a lot of free time, and they are on that phone, it can co go completely, number one. Number two, reading. Reading is really helpful. And it doesn't have to be something serious, because the next question is, can, am I allowed to read romance book? This girl between Allah and romance. <laughs> so let's come to reading and then I'll comment on this question. Reading is a very good one, actually. It really, uh, uh, read anything you like. 
as long as it's within Islamic boundary. Because again, you don't want to read something affect you negatively. I'm not going to say go and read Quran every day, يعني, every minute. Definitely make part of the reading is the Quran. Read about, for example, I don't know if it's California, read about California. Read about when you see mountain in front of you, read about, ex expand your knowledge. And the more knowledge you have, especially as a woman, especially as a woman, you absolutely, will, you will be looked at differently. And people will respect you more because she's a woman of knowledge. And knowledge is the strength for us as a Muslim. So reading is another one. Uh, spend time with friends. Person, not texting. Because this texting thing doesn't have the, the ruh, the spirit of it. Let her go out with her friends. We all spend our time with friends. Free time, productive. For example, somebody was the other day saying, subhanAllah, and they put the pictures. They said, I don't give my children, I think 14, 15, I don't give them very limited time for internet and phone. And then she showed pictures what they do. SubhanAllah, painting some part of the house, doing any creative things. The creativity will, will be, I remember I'm mean, at 14, 15, I, I love to paint, so I used to paint. Something that will make you combine happy and productive. Last but not the least from this girl, there was like about 10 questions. Can I wear makeup on special occasions? See this moment between Allah and between a dunya, which is fine. Okay, uh, makeup on special occasions. Makeup to certain extent. Who, what is this special occasion? Is it woman only? Is it mixed? Is it extravagant? Is you gonna at attain uh, attention? The answer is no. I'm not gonna say haram or not haram. Why? Because what does Islam usually do? Islam is, Islam is a, it's, I call it um, protective deen. It's a preventive deen. Like in medicine, when we, when we put the masks, why did we put the masks at COVID? That's protection. Because what, you don't wanna get COVID and when you get COVID, it's gonna be much harder. So this is how Islam, you see Islam is all, half of the Quran is protection and prevention. Don't do that. Don't do that. Give zakah. Well, if you steal, and you, then you, the punishment gets severe. So on a special occasion, this is what a lot of my friends when they were there, when I was studying actually, you know, makeup is beautiful and we all want to look beautiful. There's nothing wrong with looking beautiful. But till I get to that occasion, where is this makeup? Am I, am I showing the, my beauty to everybody? You have to all put this. At age 14, I will say yes with limitation, with very much limitation. I'm not gonna go out and I am completely showing completely my beauty. But in general, minimum, I put the makeup, when I enter, let's say, to the house with my friends, with no pictures or selfie, everything is online, because now there is the point is invalid. You get to the house, you want to look beautiful, that's fine. Before you leave, you wash. Because that's what Allah said. La yubdina Meaning, don't show your beauty in public. For your husband, absolutely. In front of your maharam, no problem. But in general, gathering of girls, young girls wants to have fun, sure. But not leaving the house or taking pictures or putting it on. And remember, as a Muslim girl, as a Muslim woman, as us all, we are example, people look at us. So if I do something said, oh, look, she is doing it, then we are fine. And may Allah make it easy. It's, it's easy said, but this, these daily things is not easy done. But wallah, you know what I always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I want you all, young and old, when you love something, and you know this something, is, I wouldn't say not pleasing to Allah, but may end up not pleasing to Allah. You know what the dua I do to Allah? I said, remove the love of this thing from my heart. So I don't have to struggle. So if you love something and you're struggling, don't say, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, uh, remove it only from, my, remove it from my heart. So if someone put it in front of me, I don't care anymore. And then staying away from it will become easier. You're too quiet, no question? Fine, no question? Already? This is a fiqh question, but I'm going to answer it because I get it very frequently. What is the ruling of vaginal discharge in the woman? Does, does it uh, negate the wudu? 
And this is very practical. Why? You are at work for 14 hours, right? So, and you are a woman who normally, again, you have a lot of vaginal discharge. Well, every time that I have to, because the question also is negate wudu, and I have to change. Like if I am sitting in 16 hours, or I am in college, or I am in class, or I am in the surgery coming out, I'm not talking about your home. So there is two opinions of it. One of them is the original opinion. And then there is a contemporary opinion based on the knowledge we learned in uh, uh, physiology and in anatomy, actually. Originally, the ruling in fiqh in every book you will read is my Anything comes out from the two openings, negate wudu. That's the asal, they say. That's the base. So if I am home, I am home, and I have no problem, I go and change and make wudu, then you absolutely follow this. Now, the recent which is actually one of my teachers, she just passed away, may Allah give her genetic fiddles. She was one of the first ones who wrote a book about that. She said, medicine showed that there is three openings, in fact. There's not two openings. Again, for anatomy, meaning, again, la haya afiddin, just to explain, there is an opening where the urine come out, and there is an opening where the stool comes out, and there is an opening where the baby comes out. So, in fact, there's three. The vaginal discharge come from where the baby comes out. The vaginal discharge, if you look at it in under the microscope, it's the same discharge that comes from the nose. So when they came to know that, they said, ah, this one is not najis. So if the vaginal discharge comes out, then it does not negate wudu. Tayyib, how do you combine these two? Because this is how we, in our deen, in fiqh, you don't just say haram or halal right away, unless something is absolutely clear, there is no, which is going to come later on. There's no question about it. So if I am in a situation where I am very comfortable, I can go and change and do my wudu, take the origin. If you are in a state, but don't be loose, Allah knows. If you are in a state where really changing, doing wudu is going to make it very uncomfortable, or let alone it's going to make you miss salah, then you take the next one. Clear? I hope. You're too quiet. I don't know what happened. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Yes. And if you are outside, you cannot, then you take the, which means it does not negate wudu. So you're, you can go and do your salah. And it's necessary that we must change. Um, if you take the first opinion, yes, it's, it's just change or you wash, or if you have, the, you, you change, yani, the panty liner, or, or you wash it. But if you take the second one, the answer is no. The only time there is no different opinion, if the woman has, it's a medical condition, we call it leukoria, where she has continuously vaginal discharge, continuous. This is, you see it, in this case, she doesn't have to change, but she's like the person who always bleed. So she needs to make wudu before every salah. Sorry, I'm asking because I, I asked a similar question. Um, so it's like, uh, is it like daily life? It's the, va the clear vaginal discharge. In the middle of the period usually happens in the middle of the cycle. It's the same gooey stuff as the vaginal discharge. Yeah, it's the same. Now look at this one. This is very deep, beautiful question. Again, I don't know who asks it. We know that Allah loves our actions. Well, there is a lot of good people out there. And people look at things very differently. I mean, this, subhanAllah. We know that Allah loves our actions when we do them purely for his sake. True? Yes? Okay. But surely... We also have in our hearts the hopes of being rewarded through that action. That does, does that hope take away from the purity of the intention? May Allah reward you. Did you get the question? So I'm going to say, Ya Rabbi, I am uh, coming to the class for you only. But I also want the reward of me coming or sitting, or struggling. So is me looking at the reward negate the fact that I am doing it purely for Allah? Did you get the question? It's very deep, subhanAllah. Yes or no? Yes? We're in big trouble. Really? Yes? Negate? Uh, now you change your mind. <laughs> of course. 
So why didn't you ask me in the beginning to repeat the question? I'm just kidding. But usually if you are not clear, you always ask to, the question to be repeated. So her question is, we're supposed to do the actions only for the love of Allah. Like what about, I want the reward also. For example, Adkaru Sabah, whomsoever says this will get 100. So what is that? So the answer is, this does not negate this. They are together. And one of the beautiful ones who said to Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, he said, we need to worship Allah based on four things. We love him. We are afraid from him. We hope for his reward. And we are we hope for his reward and we are afraid we will lose his reward. So the reward is part of the intention. And then there's many verses in the Quran, but the one I really liked is Man Amila Salihan, Min Dakarin Aw Unta, Wahuwa Mu'min, Fala Nuhiyanahu Hayatam Tayyiba. Allah, let me translate and then you will know what this verse answers the question. Allah says, whomsoever do a good deed, a man or a woman, it's actually Umm Salama asked this question. She said, all the rewards goes to the man in the Quran. Allah revealed this. So whomsoever does a good deed, a, a, a girl, a boy, a, a, a man or a woman, older, doesn't matter. Right? Man amina saliha min dhakarin wa unta. And Allah, what did he say? Has to be, he's a believer. That's the difference between the non-believer who does very good deeds. We always ask this question. You have to be a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says immediately the reward. You will live a very beautiful, pure, comfortable life. Comfortable doesn't mean you have everything. In comfort, huna. The reward comes in this life. And that's it? Yeah. Now comes in. And we will reward them for every good deed they did here, there. So you get it both. So here I am, right? I, I'm doing my dhikr because it's going to make me feel good. Alhamdulillah. Will reward me. And why am I dhikr? the reward. Alhamdulillah. So the fact that you do things to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not negate you, the reward, the fact you also want the reward. And again, sometimes think you are dealing with a generous, with the generous who will give you. Now, pills to delay the cycle, Hada, one of the most common, especially Hajj now is coming. Yani Hada, the one, literally, there is no Ramadan I lived in my life. I didn't get this on maybe every other day, if I'm not exaggerating. Can I take the pill to delay my cycle so I can fast all Ramadan or I can go to Hajj or I can go to Umrah? The answer is not yes or no. It depends. And this is extremely important. Don't say haram or don't say it is. Is the pill safe for your health? Because anything you take that harm you is absolutely not allowed. So you don't have these medical conditions that you are not supposed to take the pills with. That's number one. Number two, the answer is no, I'm fine. I've used it before, alhamdulillah. The answer is yes, but wait. And I always followed with the following. The following is, this will be the last uh, uh, question so we get the room ready for salah. As you are taking the pills, remember, it is not the pills who's gonna make you not get your cycle. Who's gonna make you not get your cycle? Why is that? Because more than 60% of the time, you will start spotting. And that's the drama, I call it, I see it in Hajj every year. So I always prepare the woman or the girl. I said, take it. It's, but, but don't think, once you take it, nothing is going to happen. You still can get it. And if you get it, then it will be very confusing. The last advice I give, and I said, this, all this is yours. I said, you want to be better than Sayyida Aisha? Especially those going to Hajj. Because she had her cycle the day they were go, entering Mecca. And I said, what did she do? Rasulullah said, you go, do everything what the Hajj does except tawaf. And now at the end, before you leave, if you still have your cycle, you can do your tawaf. So in general, overall, doesn't harm you. Anything, it shouldn't harm you. Yes, you can. It's not going to stop your pain unless Allah allows it. And put in the back of your mind that this may not work as many of the things. 
Jazakum Allahum khair and time flew actually, subhanAllah. Yeah. Subhanallah, I didn't even finish. I had like 20, just the 20, I put it in this sheet. There was way more coming. But alhamdulillah, I have a question quickly because we have to get the room ready for the men. Sp spotting when you start getting spots, not really cycle, but it just a spot, very light. Yeah. And this gets really confusing to them. So jazakum Allahu khayran, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa an astaghfiruka wa atubu ilik. Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabi tasliman kathira.